It's recording. Well, I would like to do what Father Michael is doing, which is to really uh, share over four lectures or so, five lectures, uh, a number of topics that have uh, been dear to my heart, that I've taught uh, in different settings. Um, I get to teach once a year for Humboldt State University. They send me their students, and they have a workshop and I get to expose them for a few hours to what they now call Eastern Christianity. Because they called me last year and said, you know, Orthodox sounds a bit too radical. Eastern, Eastern sounds better. Can we change the name of your workshop? I said, sure. So we're now just Eastern, uh, no longer Orthodox. But isn't it true that people come to us and expect us, because we are Eastern, Oriental, dressed like this, or like that, <laughs> to somehow uh, have something deeper, more mystical, more spiritual, so that we're supposed to know something more about meditation, contemplation, transformation. People have read um, The Way of the Pilgrim, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, wow, these people, they know something that we don't know about perpetual prayer, and they come to us and we're supposed to, uh, to live it and ideally to be able to teach it, to share it. And in many ways, um, uh, this is a, a hot topic. Uh, people don't like religion anymore, but they like spirituality. They like meditation. They like contemplation. They like transformation. And certainly, people want peace. I can say after being a priest for 10 years, which is not very much compared to many of you, can tell people want peace mm -hmm. and we pray for peace uh, in our liturgy so many times we don't even notice so I want to talk about peace during these talks I want to talk about a wisdom I want to talk about some science because also every year uh, I get to teach quantum physics for HSU extension and uh, it wasn't by, I didn't volunteer for it actually. They came to me, I gave a lecture once, and we wanted to teach quantum physics to our 50 plus extension program. And so I do so always with fear and trembling. It's a difficult, <laughs> difficult topic. Yeah. You know, I've, I've read about it for, for maybe 20 years. I did that as my, uh, my major in, in college at first. Because people have a sense that there's an intersection between the quest for truth, for science, for reality, and mysticism. Yes. And mysticism is, if you can believe it, allowed to Christians. I, I say this because this uh, yesterday, this lady came to me and she said, you know, the usual question, what are you, where are you from, what faith, what strange faith you represent, and we have to explain that we are, in fact, quite simply the church, Orthodox Christianity. And it's puzzling every time, you know, the usual, are you Romanian, Greek, Serbian? Um, so, but she said something very interesting. She said, that, well, I'm Lutheran, and um, so I know that for us, mysticism is not quite allowed. And yet, she said, when I went to Sitka, had a mystical experience. But since when? is being a Christian being non-mystical. How strange. There's a wonderful book uh, by Olivier Clément, now reposed, who was a great teacher at uh, St. Sergius. And he has a wonderful book called The Roots of Christian Mysticism. Have you ever heard about this book? It's published by New City Press. It's gray. Uh, the second edition is poorly printed, so look for the first edition. It's much better. And it is the best catechism we have so far to introduce people to really the depth of Christianity. It's really a wonderful, wonderful book. And it begins with an introduction by another Frenchman, uh, Jean-Claude Barrois. And the line is this, <coughs> Christianity is an oriental religion, period. And it is a mystical religion, period. That's how the book begins. Quite powerful and quite true. And so Christianity is, in fact, Orthodox Christianity. I mean, what's the difference? 
People say, what is it to be orthodox? To be a Christian. And it's full historical form. Fully grown. And, and everything fully accessible for everyone. For every culture. And in many ways, this slide, which uh, is... Uh, represents uh, what I'm building in my property of two acres. <laughs> I, I, I already have a dome given to me, so the rest is just a matter of time and patience. <laughs> but this, in, this slide represents many topics and many profound things that I would like to talk about to share with you. And uh, most is not new, perhaps, uh, but I will try to interweave, you know, kind of science, physics, um, and theology, because uh, it's amazing to think that the most cutting edge field of knowledge in the world today is in fact orthodox theology. Right? Isn't that amazing? That's why there's just so much to be discovered. One of the great discoveries of the last 10-15 um, years for many of us who have interest in these things has been what we call temple theology. Who has read Margaret Barker here? Apart from bloody, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Okay. And I would like to present to you, quote, the orthodox uh, <laughs> vital pieces of her work. Because if you read uh, uh, her books, it will be like eating a, a pinglet meal where you have, I uh, see, I'm not, I'm not doing it just right yet. But I have <laughs> Oh, what's that again? Shlinget. It's, it's There's wonderful meat in it, uh, but there's also a lot of, of bone and things that are just not quite uh, quite right. So I will share with you what I think is the best of this, uh, this theological approach to the scriptures. And I think it really opens the, the, the doors to rediscovering the scriptures with a new, with a new culture, with a new culture. And recently I was... Um, preparing to preach on the Dormition of the Theotokos. And um, I was thinking, you know, how does the church think about this, this feast, this mystery? How do we have this, this incredible, rich uh, understanding? Where, where does that come from? And I looked in the scriptures, and I realized uh, uh, that there's a verse in the Bible that is very, in fact, temple theology. Uh, in fact, uh, as you will see, I believe that everything is temple theology. You know, it's like when you have when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So now <laughs> I've got my hammer, and the entire Bible looks like a nail. I can hit everything with my temple theology hammer. But it, it, you will see it works from from Genesis to the Gospel of John to Revelation. It really helps us understand this great um, this great text. But I was thinking about the scene when the Lord meets, you could say, Nathaniel slash Bartholomew for the first time. And the Lord says, what I wish uh, we will hear one day, what, is, what does Jesus say, remember, when he sees uh, Nathaniel approaching the Gospel of John chapter 1? This is an Israelite indeed, not a Jew, mind you, an Israelite, in whom there is no deceit, no guile. What's the difference between an Israelite and a Jew? Hmm? Big difference, isn't there? Who could say? Which they wanted to tell Well, um, it's, a, it's an historical and temple related category. Right. First, you have the Hebrews. If you want to be really accurate when we speak, there's a Hebrews first Abraham and all that. And then they become, when they enter the Holy Land, they become Israelites, named after Jacob, who is renamed Israel. And then the first temple, which is a unique, unique temple, we'll see that in some beautiful slides I have, is destroyed, they go into exile, they come back, they rebuild a second temple, which we call Herod's Temple. Ooh, not a very good even, you know, Herod was a pretty bad guy, but it's Herod's Temple, uh, it's a different temple, is it not? It is still the house of God, the house of prayer, but it's missing many things. But when the Jews, well, when the Israelites come back from Babylon, they are now Jews. That's the difference. But there are those who are Israelites indeed, who really understand 
the whole Israelite experience. And I would like during these, uh, these short seminars to rediscover the Israelite culture, mindset. So I don't know if, if you're like me, but uh, when you read, uh, if you read, and you gave up a long time ago, uh, when you read the book of Ezekiel, does that make any sense to you? Who has ever read the book of Ezekiel from A to Z? That's just, it's confession time. You have done that, huh? Yes. Isn't that a very strange book? That doesn't begin to describe well, it. Well, I'm sure you've read Revelation from A to Z. Does the book make any sense to you? No. It speaks a culture that is just not the culture of, of North America. Give that book to someone from New York State, circa 1800s, and you get some kind of new crazy religion. It's impossible for someone with, without the culture of the Israelite to make any sense. And not just of these, of these texts, but I think ultimately of the Gospel of John. So I think by requiring the Israelite, and I would say the temple culture, which we've always had, in the church. Now we're not rediscovering, like, oh, this is like some new theology. In fact, uh, I haven't begun my slides, but it's okay. Uh, when Margaret Barker began, you know, writing, she's this old grandmother, uh, Lady Ka met her, uh, she came to St. Vladimir's to give a lecture, so she's, you know, she's accepted. She actually co-authored a book with Pedro Bartholomew. That's pretty, pretty good for a non-Orthodox. She's on her way. <laughs> On her way. And she, she, be, she, be, she began as a, um, a Methodist lay preacher. And she delved into this, this world of ancient Israel and the temple. And she says, after years of writing about this stuff and about the temple and all, the, what it meant, one day she stumbled, it seems, into an Orthodox liturgy where a bishop was serving and it was like, boom. This is all I've been reading, trying to discover for the past 10 years. And it's right there in the Orthodox Church. Sometimes we have maybe lost our ability to, to see it, you know, as icons that are so overlaid that sometimes you can't even see anymore what, what was there. And so but I think by rediscovering this, our treasure, we rediscover the mindset of an Israelite. And I would say that of Christ to rediscover the way our Lord and Savior read the scriptures and understood them. As someone told me once, I thought it was a bold and I think true statement, so I'll let, you, I'll let our, <laughs> our theologian in chief decide, he said, Christianity isn't just faith in Jesus, it's also the faith of Jesus, you know, his understanding, his world, his, the way he relates. So we have to also understand how he himself read the scriptures and understood all things. And it's, it's our, our lofty goal. Why would we want to do any of this? Because I think if we don't do this, we're like a ship who never goes in the water. Like a bird who never flies. Like a, like, like a plane who has never been in the air. We are, we are created for this. And as the world seeks other things, the world perishes. I think in our own life, I hope it's true for you, our happiest moments are or were our most spiritual moments. I can't believe that someone would say, you know, my happiest moment was a weekend in Las Vegas. <laughs> Maybe it was fun, entertaining, exciting. I, I cannot believe that a human being in the image and lens of God would say that that was their happiest, their truest moment the moment of life. I think spiritual moments are our truest moments. So there is in this image of so much, there is a beautiful temple, uh, because for us we don't call the building church. That's one of those things that we've, you know, that we've done, but we call the building the temple, the house, the temple. So there's the temple, uh, which in some ways really expresses our continuity with, with Israel. You know, whenever people come into our temples, especially Jews, they're often very surprised. But once a year, the uh, local uh, public 
middle school, they send me their seventh and eighth grade class, which is great. They bring a bus and they visit St. Innocence when they do the Byzantine Empire. And I, you know, do a kind of a song and dance for them. I know the boundaries, what the public schools will allow me to say and not say, so they keep sending them back. <laughs> and so far, so good. And it's been many years now that we've been doing this. And then after the, the session, the, the kids have to write a thank you note. And I really treasure those. Some I actually keep. They're really precious. And the best are by Jewish kids. <laughs> I, when I say, they're just amazed at how, they didn't know that, that you had a synagogue in town, that it looked like the temple, that, that you were so, so Jewish, or I would say so Israelite. They're both true. But this is this reminder. Of course, we have the cross. Lest we forget that it is about the cross. There is, uh, in this image, of course, the mountains that represent ascent, the temple of ascent, you know, the, the ascent of Jacob, the, the ladder or, or the, the staircase, as some people prefer to translate. The uh, Mount Zion, it represents Eden, which was on a mountain. It was a temple on the Mount of Eden. How do we know that? From, from Ezekiel. Here you have clouds. Now to me the clouds represent, of course, water. We'll talk about water and the symbolism of that. Uh, but to me this reminds me of our passing thoughts. Right? Our passing thoughts. Because this lecture is a bit about, about meditation, contemplation, and the struggle against our thoughts <coughs> to achieve peace and quiet inside and then there's tr uh, trees without leaves, and we can talk about you know, how trees are important, and, and the, the whole symbolism of trees. But this is, I think, a beautiful image to begin. So I want to talk about just these topics. Um, I would like someone to stop me after 45 minutes from 2.30, so we'll take a break, and then I'll just do a, a very short uh, uh, session after the break, not, take, not stretch you too much. But I want to talk about relaxation. Yeah, because I think that the way people understand meditation, really I think for us, if we used biblical categories, would be relaxation. When in a biblical sense we say, I meditate, I think it means something different than what people understand, which I think is relaxation. They're both needed, but they're not the same. Hopefully, we all relax before we pray and enter into meditation and contemplation. It's very hard, I, I suspect, to, to you know, go into your, your bedroom, your prayer corner, wherever it is, or, and then to enter into contemplation with, with the, literally the, the presence of God if we have not first relaxed. <coughs> That's why we have, first of all, this, these prayers before we pray. You know? I mean, it's true, we have prayers before we pray, and then we pray, then there's prayers after we've prayed. There's a sense of an ascent, and then a, a descent to Mount Sinai, to that uh, radiant, luminous darkness, to use you know, that language that we have in the Fathers. So we'll talk about these, these things. Uh, to relaxation, to be quiet, to be still. And I want to share a discovery that I find exciting, that I discovered not long ago. Maybe you will find that also uh, interesting as well. Uh, talk about prayer a little bit, uh, private prayer, public prayer, uh, postures in prayer, um, uh, some uh, that perpetual in prayer. Talk a bit about meditation, what the Bible means by to meditate. And then, perhaps today, I'm sure maybe at another time, we'll talk about, about for, for us, the highest form, which is contemplation, theoria. Literally, almost you could say, to, to behold the glory of God with our own eyes, almost. Now, uh, this morning was liturgy, even in this you know, humble, non-temple environment, but that's okay. I think it's important that we can pray without icons sometimes, and we can liturgize without, you know, all the, the fixings. Then we can pray without a book to tell us how to pray. 
I remember uh, reading uh, this wonderful book uh, by uh, Patriarch Germanos Constantinople, who wrote in the 700s. Have you read that book? The Commentary on the Divine Liturgy by Patriarch Germanos Constantinople. And you, can, you get to read how the Patriarch experienced liturgy in Hagia Sophia in the, in the 700s. I found that really interesting. It's a page turner to me. I'm sure some people, they would think, who would want to read a commentary written, you know, 1,200 years ago by some person? And I, I, if you have a chance, try to get this little book and read it. And uh, the patriarch conveys how amazed he is, I think, by what, what goes on. And what is interesting to me is the, some of the nuggets. It's the same liturgy that we serve today, first of all which is really amazing when you think about it. You can read a serial of Jerusalem in the 300s. He describes the liturgy. It's the same that we do today. Right? He just says all the words, the exclamations. And you, we might argue, well, there's this song. But you can sense the ethos, the spirit, is the same liturgy. Same with uh, Germanos. And at one point, he says that uh, right after consecration, and at the time of Holy Communion, that the patriarch would turn to his, uh, to his clergy and almost uh, you know, grab them by the shoulders and say, Behold, with your eyes, God is among us, walking here among us. But this experience of God that almost would, would appear to walk with them as in Eden. And uh, Senator of Kronstadt, it is known, would kind of do this, right? To, uh, he would grab people by by the, the shoulder and say, Christ is alive. You know, he had this, this sense that Christ was walking as in Eden with them. And we don't say it anymore. Maybe it was just too intense. Uh, but that was the idea that, that God was, was present as in Eden to give food to his own people. And in some ways the bishop represents, represents you know, God the Father incarnate uh, um, or you could argue maybe it's, it's the, the Logos, right? we can discuss who it is. The Logos incarnate who, who comes to feed his people as in Eden. And we may have eternal life. So, so first the liturgy has got to be the ultimate ascent. So that's our themes. Now whenever I, I present this to, to people that don't know anything, I always realize the power of, of our art, our music, uh, our architecture, our icons, and our art in itself just speaks. So I, I try to show a lot of things like, like this beautiful image. For many people, it conveys peace. It conveys something really beautiful. Beautiful. The evening light, you know, and I um, love this particular book cover. It's really a beautiful book cover. And I always try to, to tell people, you know, wh where we come from. You know, because we, we don't just come from, from Pentecost, which is good enough for any Christian body to claim with any seriousness. We, we come, we go all the way to the earliest encounter of God and man, to, to Eden. And then we, we come from, from Abraham receiving the, the angels. So we, we come from, from Jacob, who became Israel. We come from Moses and the first high priest Aaron. Now that's, all of that is our history. I recently uh, heard um, one of our priests, Father John Peck, who said something interesting, <laughs> as he's wont to do. Right? He, said, uh, he said that, why was the church in Corinth so messed up? It was messed up, all right. Yeah, we can agree. No, uh, it seemed completely messed up. And he said, maybe it is because, in some ways, they did not have the the Jewish Old Testament ethics and ethos. They were pagans, you know, who embraced the gospel, and and they did not have that that structuring revelation. I think that that kind of makes sense. It was just really pagans who became Christians, <laughs> and there wasn't be a debate. He says, well, they shouldn't all pagans first become Jews to kind of reacquire this, become circumcised, and then once they've been kind of, you know, made Old Testament-ish Jews, we can finally give them the gospel. And of course the answer was no. The gospel is everything in itself. But it, it also means that, that this whole inheritance is ours. 
You know, the, the, the psalm is our prayer book. In fact, uh, the Bible is our book. People should uh, knock on our door, ideally, and say, oh, you're the Orthodox Church, you know, and I know we got the Bible from you guys. Could you teach us? Right. After all, we still proclaim the gospel, the epistle in Greek, in many Greek Orthodox churches, the same way it was written. And actually, some of our people do understand it. I remember being in a Greek parish for many years, and, and I was studying some Greek, but I, I was listening, and after a couple of years, you kind of start recognizing the text. But it is our book. We preserved it, we copied it, we discerned its canon, we preserved the manuscripts. They came to us to get the manuscripts. Right? They came to Mount Sinai, they said, well, borrow it, they never gave it back, but <laughs> our church gave the Bible, right? To the world. And they should come to us, it's our book. Priests always do that. Yes. <laughs> it, it was Tischendorf who did that. So that's the, the idea is, is, I tell people, you know, go to Sinai. Right? This is the, a, a, a moment in history where God is revealed in such a unique way. There's one God who is invisible, and, and his name is I Am. He's not controllable, not claimable. Right? His name says, I will reveal myself to be what I will prove myself to be. You can't control me. There, it's a unique moment that there isn't many gods that you can make your own with animal heads and, and, and you can't, that you can represent and almost control. And, and our God is, is truly the, the king who, and we have no claim, as I mentioned this morning. And you go to Sinai and tell people, what's there at Sinai? It's our monastery. Right? I think it's the oldest continuously uh, <coughs> run monastery in the world, possibly with uh, some of them in Egypt. But it's... And this is where, you know, where it begins, with Moses ascending into the mountain. And I tell people also that I think Sinai is a great parable for the issue of worship today. I think there's a great crisis over what is Christian worship? What is it supposed to be? Because I have people that sometimes visit uh, our parish, say these people from HSU, they're you know, 22 year, year old kids, uh, they've uh, attended a couple of American churches uh, where it's, um, well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a band, right? And, a, and an excellent preacher, and that's what worship is. That's, it, they really, that's all they know. Christian worship is a band uh, with great songs that you can sing along, and then uh, someone who is an excellent preacher that, that better perform well, inspire you. That's worship. And they enter into this building, and they see this, and, and I now tell people, I'd rather brief you before you come. So I can explain to you why we do what we do, because they don't even think it's Christian anymore. They think we're just some kind of weird offshoot of some, I don't know. It's, it, it's interesting. That's, and in many ways, Sinai represents that. It's, it's a battle on Sinai between uh, an ascetical form of worship, right, the fasting of <coughs> Moses, who ascends with fear and trembling on a mountain where the Holy God is with smoke and fire, where, as it says in Hebrews, that, that you, could, you could die if you mishandle the mountain, basically. And he ascends to God, and God is revealed in this uh, kind of mixture of, of darkness and light. And uh, from this ascent, he's revealed the pattern of worship, this, this eternal cosmic worship, with the throne and the angels, and we can enter into it and behold it, and then we descend and are sent back into the world. That's that's the that's worship. It's not even it's not Christian. It's worship. That's the way worship has been revealed and lived because of the pattern, which is pre-eternal. And then down down the mountain is people having you know drums and a circle and entertaining music and their own. What they want to do, what's what's fun for worship, right? And, and they, they do to their, their tribal dance, and and that's 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 wrong. And there is a battle between worship that is, I would say, kind of like wisdom, that's earthly, sensual, and then a worship that is like wisdom, heavenly, beautiful, pure, timeless. So I think worship is such a huge issue. If you can convince people that worship should be done a particular way, the biblical way, the heavenly way, then it's all you need to do. 
Because where else are they going to find it? So I will continue because otherwise we're never going to make uh, you know the, the theme. But uh, so that's what I talk about. I talk about Egypt. Uh, I love Egypt because um, I mean it's just a great land. It's one of those you know one of those biblical lands. The only other land where the Lord went. There's the Holy Land and there's Egypt. It's a, it's a special place, Egypt. It's also it helps us sometimes um, understand symbolism in a new way. I think we have a very Western mind. We don't always realize that, but uh, the Western mind um, tends to break things down, to analyze things into components. Everything is made of parts. So you start with Father Michael and you break him down into organs and finally you get into, you know, so there's this reductionistic approach. Human being is made of these, these parts. Everything is made of parts. Also, we have this idea that Things are either yes or no. We have a very, you know, very yes or no, very dialectical view of the world. And I just don't think it's the biblical worldview. When I was doing uh, my thesis on ecclesiology, that was kind of my, my, my big theme, you know. And I read a book about quantum physics, a popular book called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. And he explains that there's many things are in fact holographic, as in the word, the Greek word is holis, H-O-L-I-S, holis. Uh, we have wholeness, wholesome, whole, hologram, holographic from that concept. And he says that there's things that are perhaps more primordial things, more fundamental, that you can't cut into pieces. The whole is in every part. Gives an example. I think it's a great example. He says a holographic film, which is uh, made with light, you combine light with lasers, and you create a film. That's a holographic film. Maybe there's an apple that's been encoded on the film. And if you take your film and you shine a light on the film, you know they've seen this before, maybe in a museum, or the entire apple kind of shows up out of the film, as in Star Wars. You know, if you remember that, uh, in 3D. But if you take your film and you cut the film in half and do it again, you have the whole apple, not half the apple. And you cut the film again, and then you have still the whole apple until you have a very small square, and you still have the whole apple. Now, it's less accurate, but it means that the pattern is, is in every part. This concept of parts and whole, which defines our Western mind, is just not necessarily true. And I was, I applied this to uh, doing a, a research on, uh, on John Zizulas. He has a famous book, The <coughs> Bishop Eucharist Church. Who has, uh, who has not heard about Metropolitan John Zizulas? You have all heard his name? Well, he is uh, uh, he's a metropolitan of nowhere, as he says, because Pergamon, but it's a camel stop. There's no one there, so he's a titular metropolitan. He's mostly a teacher and theologian. He lives in Greece. He's also the, the chairperson on the Orthodox side of the Catholic Orthodox International Commission. So when there's these big meetings, he tends to speak you know, a little bit for, what well, he tries, <laughs> to speak for the Orthodox world. In, in his book, he makes the point that in the, in the Orthodox Church historically, in our theology proper, the whole church is what we call the diocese. It's that simple, that, that, that the whole church is a diocese. So it's the whole church in San Francisco. It's the whole church in Los Angeles. Or it works better in, in the old countries where there's really one bishop for one city. And if you read the, the Bible, New Testament, if you read uh, Eusebius, a wonderful book to read. I don't know if you've read the Eusebius Church History. There's a, a wonderful edition by Paul Mayer it's glossy paper, there's maps and illustrations, it's, good, it's a good uh, translation. And you, you enter into the, the way the church or the churches functioned in the year 325 when you wrote the book. And, and every church is the whole church. And, and, and they form together, well, 
the church. You know, there's, in other words, the whole church is made manifest in a particular place wherever the Eucharist is served by the bishop and his presbyters and deacons. The bishop can extend the Eucharist to parishes, but it's the same Eucharist. So this idea that we always think as parts, you know, and, but that's really the Western mindset. I think the biblical mindset is that, yes, you can have the whole in every part, to use that term. So that's part of our mindset. Egypt reminds me that in the Bible, sometimes we misunderstand symbols. I'll give you an example. Is Egypt a symbol of good or evil? Is yes. Egypt good or evil? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes is the answer, right? Oh, yeah. In other it's words, it depends. When Egypt is a land that is hospitable, that quintessential biblical Middle Eastern quality is hospitality. When Egypt is, is hospitable, it's the holy land. When Egypt oppresses the people, enslaves them, it becomes evil. So sometimes you can see that Egypt is, 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 can become a symbol and it depends. Another symbol that I think is sometimes misunderstood is the snake or serpent. Is the serpent a good or evil symbol? Shall we take a vote? Good or evil? evil. What do you think? Evil. I think most people would say, just like the wolf in the Western world, yes. right? The snake is an evil symbol. But is that really biblically the whole story? Surely not. Because it is God who commanded Moses to erect a, a, a snake of bronze that is then interpreted as, as being, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in the Gospel of John, right? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son of Him be lifted up. So, amazingly, then, the, the, the snake is, in fact, there a, a symbol of, of God. But how about those words from our Lord? Be wise as serpents, serpents and innocent as doves. Is, is the snake a symbol of evil in this verse? No. In fact, what is the snake linked with? Wisdom. wisdom. With wisdom. Sophia. But is wisdom always good or always bad? Neither. And I think one of the great texts for us is James, I think it's 3.15, when he talks about the two wisdoms. One that is, you know, <coughs> earthly, demonic, creepy like like the snake you could say that is sensual the wisdom i would say that it works for you in the short term it's the wisdom of the world to become successful to become a great conqueror like um, say uh, the great alexander the, Con the conqueror the great you know the wisdom that makes you a a success in the world but does it last is it true wisdom and then there is the wisdom that is, he says, heavenly, pure. And that's the wisdom of, of the crucified Lord. It seems completely foolish for, for anyone that, by being crucified, that that would result in any, any good. But in fact, the, wi this, the wisdom of God is revealed because eternally, when you see the, the full picture, that was, in fact, the greatest act of wisdom. For us to be Christian, say when you're... You know, we're mostly uh, more than, I don't know, 45, but say so when you're a teenager and you tell people you, know, you, you should go to church, you should be, you know, whatever, chaste, you should do all those things, and, and the world says, I mean, you're going to miss out on everything, <laughs> right? You're going to miss out on all the great games, the great movies, the great dating, the great sensual experiences, and uh, we say, but we preach wisdom, a wisdom that, is, that works eternally, that truly gives peace. And there's a choice, I think, for all of us between the two snakes. I sometimes wonder when people see the, the, the bishop's staff with the two snakes and the cross, I think some Christians are terrified by it because they have only ever thought of the snake as being a, a, a devilish symbol. And they see your staff and they say, these people are not even Christians, they have this satanic symbol with with the snake. So I think that it really helps to have our our symbolism sometimes re reworked. Reworked. Egypt and 
I think the snake and wisdom are great, great examples of that. Uh, so this being said, our first uh, theme is, is relaxation. Now, to relax is what I think a lot of people call to meditate. I really think so. I, you know, people come and say, uh, you know, well, you know, I do Zen, I do yoga, I try to learn how to breathe. I think, and they don't want to think much about anything, for them that's to meditate. I, I, I call that to relax. To, to breathe, to expel a lot of toxic air, to just stop thinking about you know, all the things. I think that's, that's simply to, to relax. So there's a difference. And I think I would tend to describe this as some pre-prayer. I think before we, before we go and try to say some prayers, we should, I think we should relax. I think we should relax. And that can involve various postures. Now, I'm not a big fan of oriental postures myself. Um, some people think it works great for them. Um, I couldn't do any of these things anyway. My knees would break. But uh, <laughs> I think we have to find a posture that works for us. That is, that is, that is just relaxing. That's at peace. It can mean to kneel in different ways. It can mean to even uh, to sit, to stand. You have to find the right posture to to, to, to relax. Of course, if you, if you lie down on a bed, you may fall asleep. But that, sometimes that's what you need. But I think we have to learn in our culture how to relax, how to disconnect. You know, we, we always want to have now you know, stimulation. I mean, I, I went to San Francisco, but everywhere you go in the world, nobody is just is doing nothing anymore. Have you noticed? Everybody is, is doing things, they're walking. You, you wonder how many collisions take place every day on the sidewalk. Because people, everybody, is, everybody can relax. <coughs> Sometimes, you know, I'm at a table and you just sit down and you relax. You don't have to check your email, your voicemail, your whatever it is on your smartphone. And I think sometimes just relax, breathe, behold. I think that's something that we we've lost. You know, breathing, um, and this is not. Um, religious in many ways, right? This is just simply taking care of our, our God-given body to learn how to breathe again. To direct our mind away from the chatter, the worries. And there's certainly different ways to do this. Um, and we'll talk about maybe like the, the Jesus prayer, other ways just to, to just to, to, to keep the thoughts clear a little bit. And, and perhaps quite simply to try silence, try silence. You all drive. Do you all drive in silence? Who drives always in silence with no radio? No, almost. Right? Not always. Not always. Often. Who tends to just turn on that radio within a few minutes? No, is that true? It's a struggle sometimes to say, "I want to be, I want to be in silence for the next 20 minutes." It's addictive. I think sound is addictive, as addictive as many things. You know, to relax, mm -hmm. I hate to say, that, to say this because it may sound wrong, but uh, um, can involve uh, in the evening you know, a glass of wine. I hope I'm not shocking you, because we sing the song before every great vespers, you know, and wine to rejoice the heart of man. You know, it, it's okay, I think, to, to, to use wisdom I use wisdom, um, and it's part of, of that. Um, one of my parishioners uh, was a surgeon. <coughs> That's a very stressful, stressful job. He was a heart surgeon, mind you. That is a very stressful job. And there's emergencies at 2 in the morning. And he said it's true that you know, sometimes when you're really on edge before you can even start you know, praying, sometimes just to sit down, to breathe, you have a glass of wine. It's, it's biblical. But we have to be wise. We have to be wise. And then hopefully from this descent into, into silence, a place of silence, uh, then prayer can finally start at the right time. 
But I think this is important. For some people, this can take one minute, <coughs> though I doubt it. I think for most of us, this may take five or ten minutes. But I think we have to, to, to not rush into prayer or into meditation, but to, to do this. I know that before serving liturgy, that can be very hard to do. There's something a little bit stressful about just getting ready and coming to church. If you have three kids under five years old, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, we, I think we need this time before we can even start. The beauty uh, of our church, sometimes you know, when you're a young priest, you would like to rewrite everything. You think, uh, who in the world came up with all these prayers and all these... And then as you become older, you realize just how wise it is, how beautiful it is. I say, like, thank God I wasn't able to change things. Uh, because you see the wisdom in it. For example, that before, that before the priest reaches the sermon, I mean, there's all these steps where you can start entering into prayer. You can start relaxing the vest, you can there's postcode media, there's the sensing, you know, there's the songs. And so finally, when it's time to preach, you've had that half an hour to, to be in the right state. And I hope it's true for you as you also then listen to, to the, the Word of God being, being preached. So here, I think there's a danger um, in our spiritual life that some people, some people want a technique a, a recipe that's a technique for peace. I don't personally believe there's a technique for peace. I think that peace in our faith comes from a relationship with God. And do techniques help? I think they do, to an extent. Just say, you know, when you're, when you're married, and maybe you get some premarital counseling on, you could say, the or techniques on how to be a decent spouse, right? You know, how to listen and things like that. I mean, there's, there's some, some technique, you might say, but I think this is where we want to be. We seek a relationship. And I think we have to be careful uh, when people come to us, they seek a technique. I read, people say, well, I read the uh, Way of the Pilgrim. Uh, if, if I say 5,000 uh, Jesus prayer a day, will I have the, the peace of the book? I don't think that, that a technique is, is sort of the, the entire answer. There's, a, there's some of it here, but I think what we seek is relationship with God through, through Christ in the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to take a break now. Uh, we'll take a break for a few minutes so we can all have uh, something to, to drink and, and relax. <laughs> and uh, you can choose your breathing posture and, uh, and beverage. Uh, and then we'll be back in about 10 minutes for part two. Pardon me?